Hello, and welcome to the Urban Dharma NC podcast. This is part three of a series in which Dorje Lopan Dr. Han Lai teaches about the five Buddha families, a tantric organizing principle for understanding our own original wakefulness. Getting to know the five Buddha families can allow us a better understanding and recognition of the nuances and qualities of our own awakened nature, like a colorless light when refracted. Urban Dharma is a Buddhist temple in the heart of Asheville, North Carolina. We are supported by your generosity and by our online store, TibetanSpirit.com. To learn more about us, come visit our temple in person, or look us up online at UdharmaNC.com. Thanks for listening. Yeah, so, back here, right? Otherwise, free Sundays is not going <laughs> to... So I said, so Klesha is where we start. Yeah? Because that is sort of easiest for us to see. Right? What is ignorance? Well, yeah, I think I met that. <laughs> you know, like just earlier today, okay, yeah, I know what that is. Aggression, yep, yep, I know what that is. <laughs> Pride, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, definitely, I know what that is. Passion, oh yeah, yeah, jealousy, okay, so... That's a good starting point. We all get what these things are. Now it says, remember back to Samantabhadra's story, right? The primordial Buddha story. We say ground. And in this ground, which is no ground, <laughs> in this ground of no ground, if you want to talk about a ground, let's talk about a ground. As long as we understand that there's no grounds. <laughs> I mean, this is the Buddhist talk, right? If you insist on talking about ground, so let's tentatively talk about ground. And in tentatively talking about ground, <laughs> we'll say, from that ground moment, which is the first moment, the first part of 60 parts of one moment of awareness, or one moment of consciousness, When the second part comes, if there's no awareness or there's a misrecognition, right, then it manifests as, it could manifest as ignorance, it could manifest as aggression, it could manifest as pride, it could manifest as passion, it could manifest as jealousy, the five clashes. But if there is recognition, if there is awareness, then what would have been ignorance is now go one step up, one row up. It's the all-encompassing space, the wisdom of all-encompassing space. Uh, that's a translation for Dharma Dhatu. Um, I don't like this translation, all-encompassing space. The literal one is just the, 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 the realm of reality of Dharma, Dharma Dhatu, the wisdom of the Dharma Dhatu. So it has a sense of all pervasive, all pervasive. Um, up. Well, yeah. instead of the second moment of the second yes. moment. Yes, yeah, when there's recognition. Because then there's what, recognition. What, what would otherwise be ignorance is now it manifests as this Dharma Dhatu wisdom. Remember I said in the Yoga Tantras, there's four Buddha families. There's four Buddha families. And it's the, the next four, Vajra, Ratna, Padma, and Karma. And, and then what about the fifth? The fifth is considered like the center that emanates the fourth. So the five, in a way, is actually the center emanating the fourth. So it's from this all-encompassing or all-pervasive or dharma dhatu wisdom that the other four wisdom is particularized. So if, if the Dharma Dhatu wisdom is kind of like the underlying wisdom, the other four wisdoms are the 
kind of, um, you could say, yeah, in relation to situations, uh, they, they manifest these four qualities. Likewise, on the confused side of things, ignorance is at the root. Because of ignorance, and depending on what other conditions there are, this ignorance manifests as aggression. Or this ignorance manifests as pride. Or this ignorance manifests as passion, desire. Or this ignorance manifests as jealousy. Now, so the opposite of aggression is this wisdom called mirror-like wisdom. Mirror-like wisdom. And how, how are they related? Again, um, I have not really actually come across like in, in like the kind of Sanskrit or Tibetan or you know the text. Like they don't spell it out very clearly necessarily. But here, think about aggression. If you think about aggression, sloth is probably not in that picture. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right? That's not usually related to aggression. So what's aggression related to? Action. Hmm? Action. What kind? How? What quality of action? Uh, it's also an action. <laughs> what? Brutal. Fast. Yeah. Right? In the same way that the mirror reflects there's no pause between an object coming into yeah, the kind of the what do you call it the coming in front of the mirror. Yeah? There's no no pause between you know when the object appears in, in the range of the mirror and the reflection reflecting in there. One goes out, two come back at you. Sorry. Did that energy goes out, that two come back at you. It, it come, well, in the sense that here I think also is like, so aggression and mirror, right? See, the problem also with aggression as, as an energy, right? So if you look at it purely as an energy, it comes very quickly. Yeah? And, and its energy is very swift. Yeah? Its energy is very, right, push. That's not sloth. But it lingers. Whereas mirror, once the object is removed, yeah. there's nothing reflecting there. There's there. The, or, or the image doesn't stick around. Uh, no matter whether it's a beautiful or an ugly image. It's not like beautiful images kind of stick longer. <laughs> taken it off, right? Or oh, ugly ones, you know, it moves away faster. As long as the object is in front of the mirror, it's there. But once the object is removed, the reflection is gone. But that's not how aggression works. So this wisdom is the opposite of aggression. But it shares certain qualities with aggression. And the difference is, is there, is there the all-encompassing wisdom or not? Is all, as another way, is there ignorance or not? If there is no ignorance, that which is normally expressed as aggression, is now expressed as mirror-like wisdom. Mirror-like wisdom. I've, I've heard it um, said, this would be a more psychological uh-huh. kind of approach, mm-hmm. but if you were calling aggression anger, and then the, the mirror-like wisdom, I mean, there's a way with anger that you're, you know, it's it can, it's judgmental, it's somebody mm-hmm. calling a spade a spade, mm-hmm. but with intent to hurt or... yes. Um, but mirror-like wisdom could be um, like a mirror, just showing what is. Mm-hmm. So the intelligence of naming what is 
Mm -hmm. um, without the aggression. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you look purely at what mirror-like wisdom is, is that it has the quality of uh, it doesn't let uh, whatever the object is linger. Yeah. It leaves no trace. Uh, it responds to that situation in that very swift, very fast, very effective, uh, revealing what is to be is. No judgment. In fact, mirror doesn't have Oh, this is such a beautiful image. Right. Let's spend some time talking about it. <laughs> oh, this is such an ugly image. Let's get rid of it. it, it, it it's, it's just there. It, it, it reveals, like you say, it is what it is, yeah? with, with no judgment. Uh, but there's another quality of it, which is no traces are left behind. Yeah? Once, once that event has passed, there's no traces. There's, there's no more story to linger. Right. Uh, in, in, in ways that aggression kind of eats you up yeah. uh, it continues to consume uh, it'll, it'll burn into the mirror even so, um, if we were going to look at this kind of like what you were talking about before uh, each moment we can we have that one moment uh -huh. for the 60 different parts yes. of that moment right, right. so if we for an example angry uh -huh. but then recognized right away is that what, what Recognize, oh, I see anger. Right, so that's yeah. not Samantha Bhadra per se, if mm -hmm. you want to borrow that way mm -hmm. of explaining. Mm -hmm. Then that's the, from confusion, go to enlightenment. That's more of the, kind of the Hinayana. Okay. From confusion, let's now purify into, yeah. Which is effectively how it happens. Okay. Yeah. So because if there's recognition, that, that's already Buddha state. Every first is recognized. Mm -hmm then there's no more the other 59 parts. Then it just dissipates. So yeah. Really don't yeah. So is, is that kind of like we, we, what we'd be working on or, you know, to become aware of No, that? now we have to work on uh, being aware, yes. Just being aware. Yes, yeah. But, but it's not sort of like, it's not being Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra's story it's really a story about what underlies. I wouldn't say that Samantha Burda is a, a model for us to okay. follow, okay. per se. Right. Um, maybe Shakyamuni is a better model. You know, purifying confusion. But that's just a matter of expression. Mm -hmm. I, I know, I know what you're saying. I think you, you get it. That the point is to develop awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can... So now, right, it's more like um, two days later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go, ha, 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 that was so silly. Right. Maybe ten years ago, it's more like two weeks later. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was so silly. Mm -hmm then as we change our minds more, mm -hmm. yeah, then maybe, hopefully, you know, two minutes later, then 20 seconds later, then if we can get to immediately in that moment okay. and recognize, then there's no more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the ability to immediately recognize, mm, that comes not from just training and awareness. It comes from the whole gamut of, you know, the whole 84,000 dharmas working together to transform, uh, you know, our confused, to dissipate our confused stains. So here, if we move on to pride, yeah? So pride, you can see how that wisdom it's the opposite of pride. <laughs> Actually, more literally, that wisdom is not equanimity. I'm sorry, but these editors... <laughs> I mean, in Sanskrit, it's uh, sameness. Sameness? The quality of wisdom. Uh, sorry? 
Equality? Equality, sameness, samantha. Literally, like same. Uh, equality I don't like because Americans are too invested in that word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 Sameness, you know. <laughs> kind of like. So pride is about. I'm better. Okay. I'm better, right? You're lower. I'm yeah, better. you're lower. I'm better. Here it's like, ah, eh, sorry, you're all the same. <laughs> So no, he's here. He's not talking about you all the same, but but it's the it's the wisdom that understands, right? And and so, I guess you could say, in realizing that wisdom, then you have equanimity, yeah. mm. right? Uh, with regards to self and to other, right? that you're equal, right? that you're same. Yeah? So yes, equality, sameness, equanimity. But but equanimity is the result of recognizing sameness. So this wisdom is the wisdom of sameness, as in. So what what do you mean? So it means that you understand that everything has the same quality of having arisen out of causes and conditions. Mm. Yeah. So no matter how terrible an experience you're experiencing, you know that too is the result of causes and conditions. No matter how wonderful a time that you're having, you also know that that is due to causes and conditions, and that in both cases it's not permanent, it doesn't stick around, and it's just an experience. That kind of sameness, and that's that's you know, pride uh, is like the opposite of that. And I don't know if you have some ideas about what might be some similarities between pride and the wisdom of sameness. Because usually these two, there are some things that are kind of similar, and there are some things about them that is very different. It seems like the awake expressions could be some of that. Mm. There's some there's some quality there. Expansiveness, yeah. Your ego is very expansive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, in a way, right? Pride is is an exaggerated I, mm. right? Mm. And so in Vajrayana, we one of the one of the elements in Didi Yoga practice is divine pride. Mm. Uh, so the pride of the deity. And pride, what's pride in Tibetan? Literally? Yeah. yeah. So like, I'm victorious or I'm yeah, king. Yeah, I'm king. <laughs> so that's the word in Tibetan for what we translate as pride. Nga gyal. Gyal is king. So I king. Gyal bo is king. I king. Yeah. Me king. Uh, me king is pride. <laughs> but is, there's a hint about what's underneath that me king kind of thing, maybe with it, there's also because it also the neurotic expression includes hunger, poverty mentality. Mm-hmm. So you know, so in some way, I'm the king sounds like you know ego run wild. Yes. But you're saying what's underneath it is this feeling like oh my god, maybe I'm not enough. Yes. There isn't enough. Yes. Um, and so maybe sameness would mean there's enough for everybody. Um, yeah, it's when I'm enough. it's when the I there is the I exaggerated along some side lines that becomes pride. Right. Then there is the I exaggerated where that becomes the bodhisattvas. I'm inseparable from all. Mm. You beat that dog, I feel the pain. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, yeah, so there's that expansiveness that is neurotic and, and, and confused. And then there's the expansiveness of um, we're inseparable. Mm-hmm. And again, so back to the issue of inseparability, again, 
the, the Buddhist tradition wants to emphasize inseparability as an experience rather than as a metaphysical statement. Hindus are much more comfortable with inseparability as a metaphysical fact. Like, like we all dissolve into the great ocean of da da da. That's, that's really much more Hindu expression. I'm not saying that these are two different experiences. I'm just kind of clarifying. Different traditions kind of have different styles. In Buddhist tradition, the inseparability, they're much more concerned with like, can you experience the inseparability of self and other? And, and, and what is the consequence of experiencing the inseparability of self and other? That's what matters more to the Buddha than to metaphysical, uh, uh, conse- kind of metaphysically. You see, okay, I'll make a case, I'm prejudiced, of course, as a Buddhist. <laughs> I'll make a case for why there is a difference to be made between thinking of it as experiencing such a state and believing that this is how it is. Believing that this is how it is, that we're inseparable, right? Rather than really experiencing that, can in a perverse way turn into not caring at all what other people think or how other people feel. There's a fine line between a Buddha and an asshole. (laughs) Neither of them cares what other people think and what other people feel. (laughs) But very different kind of not caring. Right? But that's not caring, it's the supreme caring. <laughs> the asshole, you know, is so self absorbed. And in a way, you could say the self absorbed person thinks that all is one and one is me. <laughs> right? <laughs> all in one is one is me. Because we're so good at always having that me be the reference point. So on this side of confusion, it's better to maintain good boundaries. There's you, there's me. I need to be sensitive to what you like and you don't like. And not do things that will you know, cause other people to be unhappy and not go too soon to the we are all one. Um, In the end, is it or not? Well, I don't know. We're not there yet. (laughs) Well, maybe you are, but... (laughs) Here, you know, like, my part of the driveway, I would like to know where it ends so that (laughs) I know to go sweep. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, those dishes, those dishes are mine. <laughs> you don't want to have all the dishes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. 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 yeah, I mean, if, if it is a neurotic, uh, everything is me, it's also very painful. Very painful. And if you have no way to transform that pain, then... It's not liberation to think that everyone is me. Uh, I believe there are like kind of clinical disorders of that sort. No, no, maybe no, no, you, maybe you know. Maybe some, some, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, Katia. Um, well, I guess I was thinking narcissism. Uh-huh. Or, or, no, it's kind of like the pain. That you feel, you know. oh, everybody yeah, is everybody is me. Right. Yeah, there's probably some sort of clinical right. disorder like, that is related to that. Yeah, yeah. overly, empath- yeah, overly empath- empathizing. empathizing. Yeah. Right. Um, there's also there was one case I heard about 
someone who meditated a lot in Europe, uh, as a result, I mean, 30 or so years, but it's, it was in a, a psychiatric ward where the doctor then called some researcher in the U.S. that researched like meditation and say that I have a case of a patient who I think something about cannot distinguish herself from other people. Yeah, like a psychotic. Yeah, in a psychotic way that is yeah. not Buddha at all. Mm-hmm. You know, like like asking this researcher, like, have you come across? And the researcher is like, yeah, of course, it's said in the text that all these traps, you know, mm-hmm. and how you could kind of, you know. Rather than being enlightened. Yeah. So here then, desire or passion. Uh, when there is awareness, when there is no ignorance, is called the discriminating wisdom, or the wisdom of um, discernment. Yeah. To be able to discern. Here I think. Desire often is the desire is often takes over when there is no discernment, <laughs> right? Oh, that mala is so nice. <laughs> That's my problem. That's so <laughs> it's like, oh, that mala is so nice. Actually, it was last summer, and not not this one. This one I have. <laughs> Um, it's, the, it's the one in Lhasa last summer. Uh, there's a, a, a Bodhisattva mala smaller than this one that was selling for 6000 or something like that. Wow. And I was just standing there making up all kinds of valid reasons why I should own it. <laughs> all very Buddhist, the explanation. <laughs> but then there's a part of me that says, walk away, walk away, walk away. <laughs> I mean, of course, not that I had 6,000 with me, you know, but I was even like thinking, if I go to bank, if I go here, 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 if I call this person, this person, this person, I'll have 6,000 cents here, and then I'll get home and deal with it, <laughs> right? So, so there's no discernment going on. Uh, it's exaggerated. The object of your desire is completely exaggerated, right? So substitute mala with, you know, him or her or it or whatever. When desire takes over, there's no discernment. Yeah, But like discernment, it arises sort of from a certain obsession with something. It uh, it arises from interest. (coughs) In another sutra, uh, in the early Hinayana, so-called Hinayana section, Buddha talked about the seven things that leads to discernment. One of the first things is interest. I don't remember all the other parts, but one of them is interest. So interest has to go first. Then from there, it leads to discernment. Likewise, with desire, for whatever reason, interest gets your attention there, and then it leads to discernment flying out the window and exaggeration. Then, oh... This is so desirable, you know. Of course, other people standing on the side are like, <laughs> yeah. My fellow travelers was like, "Are you crazy? Six thousand dollars for a mala?" I said, "But, but, but, look." <laughs> there were like twelve coral beads, red coral, like gold. And so I was rationalizing. I could take the six. I could take the 12 beats out and go sell that. And that will probably be about a thousand. So really, it's only about five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I found fascinating. Discernment is like it's this proliferation of possibilities and possibilities and possibilities. Yeah. And then when you have like because a lot of times I would think, well, that just means, oh, you're going to be a better thinker. Uh-huh. But really, I think what it's saying is to become non-conceptual, like to stop that thinking process. Because the Here, not necessarily. I, I think there's a difference between proliferation of thoughts and discernment. Discernment is always clear and crisp. 
would just would yes. cut through it saying, yes. yeah. It's always Stop clear it. and crisp. <laughs> There's no exaggeration going on. And, the, and Amitabha is about desire. So now if you go up and down, right, these columns, yeah, yeah, yeah they're all related. So Akshobhya is about aggression, but purified. Uh, so Akshobhya's symbol is this weapon, this weapon that destroys. Mm, but it's the mirror light, the sharpness of that, that just cuts through, that destroys. Likewise, the discernment here is the lotus. Uh, what about the lotus, you know? Out of the muck. Out of the muck, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's related to desire. Because lotus uh, is also a code word. Right, just like vajra is also a code word. <laughs> we'll get into we'll get into that. part two. The secret That's code. The code. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> you have to yeah. come next week to find out. <laughs> yes. So Amitabha. Uh, I, I know somebody have asked before. They said, and I don't know where this comes from. I only heard it before. Like, why is it that uh, uh, kind of dharma rose? Uh, this color and they say well it's related to the red and it's related to the transforming of attachment and desire mm. uh, that you have given that up and so now you wear it as an ornament um, so there's something about that uh, exactly what I don't know again <laughs> Trumba Rinpoche has experimented with this more so than the other traditional teachers. So in the Shambhala system, I don't think they do it anymore now, but at one point they have these like color therapy. Yeah. So they have rooms that are yeah, painted like sure. red. Yeah, they still do it. They still Naruba, do it? Naruba. Oh, yeah, but not so much their overall system yeah. anymore. No. Yeah. So they have the, 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 the different you know, Buddha families, yeah, different yeah. colors and... Uh, now they have a different system of training, you know. Um, but it's a therapy considered right, in Naropa. Right, within the Naropa, because it's a legacy of, of Tumba Rinpoche, mm-hmm. you know, who has mm-hmm. experimented a lot more with these. And, and like I said, you know, the, in the Tibetan use, it's, it's just kind of like, more or less you know this. It's, it's never so kind of directly taught and, and reflected on. At least in my experience, mm-hmm. not not the kind of reflection. This chart never existed before, but Rinpoche didn't make this up. You know, it's calling from all the different sources and putting them all together, and 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 you see certain things that is not seen so clearly uh, in in the traditional context. So something emerges for us. Because um, we we're, we're trained, we grew up learning like this. Right, we grew up learning like this. We right, grew up Tibet. learning in a string of syllables, and they construct this, some, or some semblance of this. Right, right. they're used as like a serial string of syllables. <laughs> so, yes, or, the, or a diagram like that. No, no. like when they meditate, though. And not how they initially learned. Yeah, no, not yeah, how they not, learned. Yeah, They're not like later. blackboard learners, like we have yeah. spatialness. The spatialness is different. Now, increasingly, now they are. And so that's why traditional methods, if they don't change, they'll be in trouble. Why? Because every young monk grew up with this. <laughs> and their way of learning is different. It's, it's now this way of learning. So they go to class. The teachers are still teaching that. A string of syllables. One of my proudest accomplishments was introducing a whiteboard, a small one in our class, to Kevin E. McGelson. Uh huh. He is so sharp that he got it. He switched paradigms. Right. Like, one, over one class, by the time we came back to the next class, he was using it like he grew up with oh, yeah. diagrams. Right. They're totally, so, I mean, huh. they are intelligent people is as intelligent mm-hmm. as any of us. Uh, it's just that you know the pedagogy has not changed yet. Monastic pedagogy is kind of behind. Um, so finally, jealousy. 
The opposite of that is what's known as the all-accomplishing wisdom. They say jealousy prevents us from accomplishing anything. I don't know. Think about it. I don't think in the abstract. Think in your yeah. own life. Yeah. All of this, you know. We're busy, right? Yeah. We're busy, like sabotaging. <laughs> sabotaging. <laughs> we don't accomplish anything. And and when we act out the jealousy, and in, in order to accomplish anything, you need other people to to support you. And if your jealousy prevents you from um, recognizing the qualities of others, then nobody can help you. <laughs> nobody can help you. You know. So it's different than like jealousy. <clears throat> Like keeping up with the Kardashians, like you know, you want. Does that be more envy? It'll be more envy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that is a fear of, I think. Here, here is much more like you know, I I see that. I am not. I am just not happy that you are happy. Yeah. <laughs> here. If somebody praises you, immediately I say, "Well, do you really know him? Let me tell you about <laughs> you know, blah blah blah." You know. Yeah, it's a little bit more than envious. Envy. It's, it's really a, a. I think maybe envy is more subtle than than jealousy. Is there okay. a better translation for all accomplishing action or for jealousy? It's it's all accomplishing wisdom. Yeah. As in, yeah. as in that which accomplishes all. Yeah, Joe was just wondering if all accomplishing and jealousy. Is... One way I've heard it is like it, it can't, it's, it's um, instead of thinking that what you want to accomplish will happen by competing and, and, um, and being jealous, trying to over, you know, override someone else, mm -hmm. um, the, the wisdom would be, um, would be knowing that the action is accomplished from a from a, a, a different place. It's accomplished from um, well, the mudra is fearlessness. It's actually accomplished from um, from mm -hmm. a place of fearlessness, and then all the action that needs to be accomplished is accomplished without your mm -hmm. forcing it or fighting, competing for it. This, this all accomplishing also has a sense of like um, not just mine is accomplished. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. The bigger. Yeah, the, the, the bigger all is accomplished. Mm. Not just my petty little agenda. Mm -hmm. And as long as we, we, we just, you know, mm -hmm. that, then, then, then someone's gain is my loss. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like there's mm -hmm. a finite number of things that can be accomplished right if somebody accomplishes it then i i i have lost like a zero sum yeah it's a kind of a zero sum view of things mm -hmm. you know but here rather to kind of see it as you know it accomplishes all and so there's there's this jealousy is kind of like a moot point it, it kind of in fact it gets in the way right. mm -hmm. you think that you can only you know you know, forward your agenda by putting down other people's agendas. Mm -hmm. 
Is it kind of like a fire line then, where you're passing the bucket up to douse the fire? I can think of it that way, yeah. Yeah, so, so we have run out of time for today. Uh, Hi. And uh, <laughs> um, so you should take this with you, this chart, and over the next week, you know, kind of go up and down mm -hmm. to kind of play with this and see, you know, what are the connections that are being made. Yeah, so then next week, um, we'll look at, you know, all these other parts. Um, and um, also a little bit about the Buddhists, the male Buddhists and the female Buddhists. Which is, uh, I don't know why the, the Mrs. Buddhists are not here. <laughs> Weird. The Mr. Buddhists are here. <laughs> so we'll, we'll add that in. Um, I mean, season of the year is there. <laughs> and then the elements. Yeah, I mean, they, they are present in the form of these elements, but they have their names too. So let's uh, close with a dedication, and the usual dedication that we do is the Eight Verses Mind Training Dedication, which is on page 147 of the Recitations book. Uh, so the idea here is that whatever that we have learned, whatever we have accumulated, we direct the energy, we direct the blessings, we direct the merit uh, towards the fulfillment of it these uh, trainings that are in this eight verses of mind training. Before I forget, um, one thing about merit. We talk so much about merit, 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 until, and then, however, in this culture, the word merit, especially when wedded or given in the context of religion, is uncomfortable for a lot of people. Mm. Mm. This is, I think, part of being in a dominant Protestant culture um, merit kind of stinks of indulgences and uh, the whole Catholic um, you know or a certain type of Catholic practice that have been kind of criticized by Protestants mm, this idea of merit like you're hoarding up spiritual stuff right? Uh, but the teachings say, you know, if you don't have merit, forget about spiritual progress. Uh, worldly progress you know, will, will not be accomplished if you don't have merit. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there is a psychology to merit that is, you know, whether you want to be so literal about merit as a spiritual force, although I don't think they are different. <laughs> but if we use the language of psychology, I was just sharing this with people at, in Arkansas. I say, I think one way to think of merit is a healthy sense of self is what you're accumulating. And you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel good about yourself? by cultivating virtues, by being generous, uh, by giving, by not harming, uh, which is the essence of the precepts and the vows. When we <coughs> accumulate, the more we <coughs> accumulate that, then the healthier a sense of self that we have. And in this kind of graded, you know, teachings, you know, the gradual path, we say that if you don't have enough merit, you cannot achieve, you cannot effectively use the wisdom teachings. Translate this slightly. Without this healthy sense of self, that is constructed, all cells are constructed, Buddha said that already, 
without a healthy sense of self, without a sense of self that is constructed from friendliness, generosity, uh, not harming, right? If you apply the wisdom teachings, it can lead to a very dark place. Because part of the strategy of the wisdom teachings is to dismantle, is to dismantle your neurosis. And if all you have is that self that is neurotic, and the dismantling takes place, you have no place to land in the negative sense of the word, in the negative sense of no place to land. Not in Trovern, but it's groundlessness. <laughs> and sometimes we mistake the two. So the more we practice Dharma, the darker things get. Because we have jumped ahead. We don't, we don't think we need to accumulate merit. In part, we don't think we need to accumulate merit because you know why? We, no, actually, because we are living in a place, in a situation that is the result of having accumulated a lot of merit. So we take merit for granted. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Why is it in third world country people are so focused on accumulating merit? Because there's so many things to remind them that it's not, this is not such a comfortable place. So we are in the God realm. Mm. We got here with a lot of merit, and with a lot of self-confidence, with a lot of, you know, yeah, we got here because of a lot of merit, but we're just squandering away our merit and think that, oh, I'm, ah, merit, that's just so... <laughs> middle class <laughs> money who talks about money it's just so middle class well all the aristocrats in England if you watch what is it Down Abbey Down Down Abbey yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to go to America to find their middle class to marry right to save their estates <laughs> so be good Americans at that point, you know, accumulate a lot of merit and feel good. Because without feeling good, a healthy feeling good about yourself, you apply the wisdom teachings, it can be really traumatic. That, that destabilizing of the self, the dismantling of the self, it can be very unnerving. And one way to accumulate merit is to dedicate merit here. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare for all sentient beings, to surpass even a wish granting jewel, may I train to hold them as supremely precious. Whenever I associate with others, may I train to think of myself as the lowest among all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions may I train to search into my mind, and as soon as an afflictive emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. May I train to cherish beings of that nature, and those oppressed by strong sins and suffering, as if I have found a precious treasure very difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, may I train to take on all loss and offer victory to them. When one whom I have benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, may I train to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, may I train to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly, and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mothers. 
May I train to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly conceptions, and by understanding all phenomena and slight illusions, be released from the bondage of attachment. Then they also say there is no merit in even virtuous actions if there is no joy. So, again, we, we, you know, in our culture, we say, do good and don't think about it anymore. Like, hide, hide your good deeds, right? Generally, this is the... And, and there's something to be said about that, you know, not to parade around the good that you have done. But don't go too far in not recognizing that this thing called merit only arises when you have engaged in something virtuous, and then you say, ha, ah, that was good. You see how it's related to a healthy sense of self? Yeah. Rejoicing. Yeah, in rejoicing and saying, <laughs> ah, that was good. Yeah? Okay, so now fold the chair, put it back in there, and say, that's very good. <laughs> can, can I take a few minutes and make a couple of announcements? Oh, Thank you for listening to the Urban Dharma NC podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll consider supporting our mission to foster a deeper understanding of the teachings of the Buddha, to build meaningful community, and to integrate contemplative teachings into everyday life. We invite you to make a donation online at udharmanc.com or make a purchase at our store, tibetanspirit.com. Thank you. May all beings benefit.